Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the uh, temperature scale and thermometers. All right, now there are two main temperature scales that uh, we're all familiar with. One is the Fahrenheit scale and the other one is the Celsius scale. And to see how these are both related, we'll draw a simple little graph here. So what we have is, uh, oops. So what we have there is a, uh, the marking off of the freezing and the boiling points of water in the Fahrenheit scale and the freezing and boiling points of water on the Celsius scale. And these two points, uh, right here, you know, we can connect both of these and then draw a straight line between them. Okay, so that's our relation between degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. Now, of course, we want to, you know, figure out, well, what is the equation that describes this relation? Well, we can uh, use here the, basically, the change in Fahrenheit over the change in Celsius, and that's going to be our slope over here. So that's just going to be 212 minus 32 over 100 minus 0. So that's going to be 180 over 100, which is going to be 9 fifths. All right. And then the other thing we have to figure out is the intercept. And this, of course, is when your you know, degree Celsius is equal to 0. And that, of course, happens when your degree Fahrenheit is equal to 32. So this right here is going to be our intercept. So we can write down uh, our equation that the degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths times the degree Celsius plus 32. All right. And this is you know, an equation. I will give this to you, so don't worry about uh, memorizing it, but you know, just obviously be able uh, to use this. Now we can also uh, just move this equation around if we have to solve for Celsius. So we're just going to subtract 32 from both sides and then multiply by 5 ninths. So this is going to be 5 ninths times, and don't forget your parentheses, uh, degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. And that is going to be equal to uh, the degrees Celsius. One interesting little uh, e um, temperature is when the degrees Fahrenheit is actually equal to degrees Celsius. So we can actually just solve uh, for this quite easily. So if we, we can just basically say when these two are going to be equal. So if we have the degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths times the degrees Fahrenheit, since we're saying this is going to be the same temperature, um, plus 32, well then right here uh, that's going to be 1 minus the 9 fifths. So that's just going to be 4 fifths times the degrees Fahrenheit, and don't forget the negative sign there, um, is going to be equal to 32. So 32 um, times 5 divided by 4, well, 32 over 4, that's uh, 8 times 5. So that means that your degree Fahrenheit is going to be negative 40. And like we said, that's also going to be uh, the degree Celsius as well. So at this temperature here, um, that's actually when the temperature is equal to the same, to in, both in Fahrenheit and in Celsius. Uh, it's exactly uh, the same temperature there. Guys, I hate to interrupt, but the temperature's falling. We just passed minus 40. Celsius and Fahrenheit. That temperature is the same. Really? Didn't know that. Now, what is temperature? Is that the temperature, when we're going to be talking about this, is going to be proportional to the kinetic energy of the particles. And kinetic energy is one half times the mass of the particles times the velocity of that, the particles squared. So this is the mass, and this is your velocity. So how fast those particles are actually going. So if you have something that's very cold, the particles are not going to be moving as fast. If you have something that's very, very hot, the particles are going to be moving um, with a very high velocity. All right, now there's a couple of different methods for actually determining what the temperature is because, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult to go through here and, you know, actually measure the velocities of all your little gas particles. All right, so there's a couple of ways of actually figuring out the temperature. Uh, now, the first way um, that they actually did this was uh, using something known as a gas thermometer. And the reason they do this is because, you know, measuring the velocity of these particles, you know, is really impractical. So you need something that's going to be basically proportional to the temperature and use that um, as your basis for setting up a temperature scale. So when you use this gas thermometer, you have here that the pressure of the gas 
is going to be proportional to uh, the temperature of the gas. And this is when actually you're dealing with uh, constant volume. Okay, now this again is, is not exactly a uh, easy way of doing this because if you're dealing with the pressure of a gas um, at constant volume, uh, these things uh, get quite unwieldy very fast and it's not exactly a, a trivial thing to uh, set one of these things up. Uh, but uh, one thing, once they actually did measurements on this, uh, they actually figured out that uh, a couple of interesting things can actually happen here is that eventually the pressure of the gas is going to reach zero, right? So the pressure, you know, if you get cold enough, is eventually going to go to zero. So the question is, well, what happens to the temperature? And at this point, they started realizing that there might actually be a lowest possible temperature that you could actually reach. Because, you know, if you start having pressures negative, that really doesn't make any sense. So, you know, they actually figured out that uh, the temperature can only go, you know, as low as when the pressure um, reaches zero. And at that point, of course, the velocity of the particles goes to zero, and you can't have anything moving slower than stopped. So they realized that eventually there has to be a temperature here that actually reaches zero, and they call this absolute zero. So what they did was they took the Celsius temperature ranges that we have, and then just used put an offset onto this and devised a new temperature scale known as the Kelvin scale. So here the Kelvin scale is going to be equal to the degree Celsius plus 273.15. Right? So zero degrees Celsius when uh, water melts is going to be equal to 273.15 Kelvin. And also, um, as you may have noticed here, my degrees Fahrenheit, uh, degrees Celsius, and over here degrees Celsius, all these have a degree sign. The Kelvin doesn't have a degree sign. So you would say 273.15 Kelvin, but zero degrees Celsius. So there's no little degree sign uh, on the Kelvin uh, scale here. Okay, so what we have here is a comparison between the three temperature scales, uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Uh, one thing to just note when you're looking at this is that the scale is not linear. It is, in fact, uh, logarithmic. And you can just see that if you look at the Fahrenheit range, uh, we're going from about uh, minus 459 all the way up to uh, nearly 10,000 uh, degrees. So there's a obviously a very large uh, range that we're covering here, and it's not obviously spaced very evenly. Um, all these values have just been rounded to uh, integers, uh, just for a little bit of simplicity there. Uh, now, if you notice right on the bottom there, absolute zero. This is the lowest possible temperature we can ever have. Uh, at that point, um, all molecular and atomic motion ceases, so you can't go any slower than being stopped. So at that point, you can never have a negative, uh, degree, negative Kelvin. It simply doesn't make any sense. Um, but absolute zero um, is also negative 273.15 in terms of degrees Celsius and minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the cosmic microwave background, uh, which is basically the temperature of the background radiation universe, is at 2.73 Kelvin. So that's a fairly low temperature. However, the lowest temperature that humans have ever attained is about 100 picokelvin, or 100 times 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin, and that was obtained in 1999. Uh, the boiling point of helium, which is the lowest boiling point of an element, and really the lowest boiling point of any substance uh, we have, is at 4.2 Kelvin. So it's, it's fairly, fairly cold, and, and helium in, uh, displays some very interesting properties when it gets down to those very low temperatures. Um, and as for actually reaching absolute zero, that is impossible. Um, that's actually from the third law of thermodynamics um, for that. Um, anyway, next up, uh, we have the boiling point of hydrogen, which is around 20 Kelvin. Uh, nitrogen, which is, you know, the vast majority in the air, is at 77 Kelvin and has many applications. Actually, it's, it's fairly cheap, about a gallon of liquid nitrogen. It's about the same as a gallon of milk. It's actually a little bit cheaper than that, so it's actually uh, fairly uh, cheap for that. Uh, dry ice, um, it doesn't actually melt for dry ice, remember that's why it's dry, it does not actually form a liquid at atmospheric pressure, so it goes directly from a solid into a gas, and the sublimation point is 195 Kelvin, or uh, about negative 78 degrees Celsius, or minus uh, 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, next up we have the melting point of ice, which of course is at 0 uh, degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, 273.15 Kelvin. Uh, boiling point of water is 100 degrees higher, so that's at 373 Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit. Um, aluminum melts uh, around 660 degrees Celsius, 
Gold melts around uh, 1337. Uh, pure copper uh, melts around, uh, you know, about 1000 uh, degrees Celsius as well, so a little bit above gold. Uh, tungsten, which has a very, very high melting point, uh, that's why it's uh, used in light bulbs, uh, is actually the highest melting point of any element. Uh, which is uh, 3,410 uh, degrees Celsius, or about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And also, uh, next up there, the surface of the sun, uh, which is about uh, 5,800 Kelvin. Uh, you may have uh, seen on light bulbs, they talk a lot about color temperature. Uh, that's actually what they're referring to. So you heat the substance up enough, um, you'll actually get uh, this glowing, which can look uh, like the sun. And uh, the surface of the sun is relatively cool at about uh, you know, 5,800 Kelvin. Meanwhile, the interior of the sun is like 10 million Kelvin, so it's much, much, much hotter. All right, so why do we need thermometers which can help determine the temperature? Well, first of all, our bodies do a lousy job at determining what the actual temperature is. Just think about this. In January, if it's 50 degrees, everyone is warm and they're in their shorts. If it's 50 degrees in July, everyone is freezing. So our bodies do a very bad job at determining what the actual temperature is. All right, and the reason this happens is because we measure heat flow. Yeah, there's a little experiment that uh, you can do at home uh, showing you know, just how bad people are at determining temperatures. You know, here I have, you know, obviously the wood table, and here I have uh, my metal calipers. Now, both of these have been sitting out. Uh, they are both at the same room temperature. But, you know, if you just try touching, you know, the wood over here versus the metal, which one of these two things actually feels colder? And I will let you, you know, go ahead and touch them to figure out which is actually colder. And what you should realize is that the wood here doesn't feel as cold as the metal does. And the reason for this is that the wood is an insulator, the metal is a conductor, and the heat doesn't flow as fast into the wood as it does into the metal. So really what's happening here is that we're not detecting the actual temperature of the object. We're detecting how fast the heat flows out of our fingers. So really people aren't sensitive to the actual temperature. They're more sensitive to the actual amount of heat flow. And if you also think about this, every time you go and bake something in the oven, you stick your arm into the oven, absolutely no problem. If you happen to touch any of the metal, you get, it feels much, much hotter and you get seriously burned. And that's because, you know, the air is fairly uh, good at insulating, uh, but the metal is very good at conducting the heat, and that's why you feel the hot metal much worse than the uh, hot air. So what we'll be seeing here is that temperature is actually related to pro intensive properties, and these are properties which are independent of how large the system is, uh, such as the pressure and the density, and we'll be seeing that in a few minutes. And this is the whole reason why we can use gas and alcohol thermometers. And the way this happens is you pick a reproducible standard, uh, such as the freezing and the boiling point of water, and then you just interpolate between the points. So you just hope that everything's a nice linear progression and it works out quite nicely. Now a little nice historical footnote here is that when Celsius originally developed his thermometers, they went backwards. So 100 degrees was the freezing point of water and zero degrees uh, was the boiling point of water. Um, but after his death, all the other scientists said that was kind of stupid, and they went to the system that we currently enjoy today. Uh, also, once they were doing all this, they did finally realize about the absolute zero. Uh, once they started applying the data out, they realized that you know maybe things will actually stop if you do get cold enough. Uh, now here's just a little summary of some of the early uh, thermometers that existed. Uh, so in 1641, um, Archduke Fer Ferdinand of Tuscany, um, he was just trying out some low reference points and upper reference points. But here, we don't really know what the temperatures were, at least from this reference. And he was just going from you know, how cold it gets in the winter to how hot it gets in the summer. But again, you're dealing with Tuscany, so uh, not exactly very cold weather you're dealing with. Uh, in 1688, uh, J. Delance uh, used the melting point of snow as negative 10 and plus 10 as the melting point of butter. Uh, in 1701, Isaac Newton uh, used zero as the melting point of ice and plus 12 as the human body temperature. Uh, 1708, Romer uh, used an ice salt mix, which he said at zero, and plus 60 as the boiling point of water. Uh, then, of course, Fahrenheit uh, used what we're very used to now is plus 32 for ice and uh, plus 212 for the boiling point of water. And then, of course, there's Celsius, and like it says there on the bottom, um, it was inverted after his death, but there's the zero for ice and 100 for water. And in 1954, they actually uh, said here, which is our current reference point uh, for all the whole temperature scale, as the triple point of water. 
And this occurs at only one pressure and one temperature, so it's an invariant point. So they can just use that. And now the other uh, point that they would technically use would be absolute zero itself. So what they're basically doing there is taking the 273 as the upper and then saying, well, as low as you can go is zero, and then just dividing between there. And that's uh, how we define the Celsius and Kelvin scales today. Now, like I said, gas thermometers are kind of impractical to use. Um, and you really don't encounter them unless you're dealing in uh, a very specialized laboratory. But something that you are probably more familiar with is actually a uh, mercury thermometer or an alcohol thermometer. So just to here is going to be a little drawing of an alcohol thermometer just to display what's going on here. Okay, so right here, this is a very crude drawing of a alcohol thermometer. And the reason that we use, you know, either alcohol, and this of course would be the red ones that we'd see, or, you know, the old fashioned ones, uh, mercury. Mercury thermometer, HG. Uh, the reason we don't use mercury anymore is of course because of the, uh, the uh, environmental cost of the mercury. So we, we try to avoid those as much as possible because people tend to break them and then you have mercury all over the house. Uh, so nowadays we just use the uh, alcohol thermometers. But in both of these cases, these work because the temperature is going to be inversely proportional. Whoops, try that again. The temperature is going to be inversely proportional to the density of the uh, alcohol or the mercury. Okay, so this, of course, is the density. And we remember that here the density is equal to the mass over the volume. And since this is inversely proportional to there, so that's going to be the volume over the mass. Now the mass of, in this thermometer is constant because of course it's a sealed system, so all that can happen is that the volume can change, but the mass is not going to change. So therefore, since my mass isn't changing, this means that the temperature is going to be proportional to the volume of my liquid. And uh, fortunately for alcohol and mercury, these are nice linear relations. So you know, if the temperature uh, goes up by 5%, the volume is going to go up by 5%. So you can you know, very easily just say, OK, uh, put this in ice water. There's my little zero mark. Heat it up in boiling water. There's my 100 mark. And then just draw 100 little divisions between there. And you have a fairly accurate thermometer that you can actually use. OK, so this is a fairly common one that, uh, that we're used to. All right, another type of thermometer that you probably have, you know, either in your uh, oven or in your refrigerator, is uh, something like this little bimetallic uh, strip thermometer. Okay, so uh, this one, you know, has no, you know, electronics in it whatsoever. But now this is probably not going to show up well on the camera. But there's a little coil uh, here on the back, and what happens is that this coil here uh, is looking like this. So it just goes around, coils around. And this coil expands um, when you heat it and shrinks when um, you cool it. And when that does that, that moves the uh, little uh, knob or the little dial here telling you what your temperature actually is. And the reason this works is this is called a bimetallic strip. So what you have here is two dissimilar metals, which are joined like so. Okay. So this would be, you know, metal one would be here, and I'll draw it with a little red here. And this would be metal two over here. So these are, you know, at one temperature, and then what happens is when you heat it up, uh, this thing um, expands just a little bit more than my other metal here. And now this is going to be one and two. So this one expands a little bit more than the other metal, and that causes the thing to curl around. That causes it a, a deflection, and then that deflection causes the little dial to move. So in this case, what's going on is that the temperature is going to be proportional to the length of your um, metal coil. So that's another variety you can have. OK, there's also some other varieties uh, that we can use. Um, if you're doing a, you know, like a very high precision work or you have one of those um, electronic uh, thermometers, uh, generally what you might have in there is what's called a, uh, a thermistor, or, a th or actually a thermocouple in this case. So you have two different metals uh, joined up here. So this is a thermocouple. 
and what happens is you have these two different metals and as you change the temperature the voltage between them changes and the temperature in this case is proportional to the voltage and it's actually related to what's known as the Seebeck effect but uh, you see this change in voltage it goes through a bunch of amplification circuits and then you can uh, figure out what the temperature actually is um, another type is known as a thermistor and in that case we have here a resistor so that's the electronic symbol for a resistor and as you uh, change the temperature the resistance changes in a, a nice dependable pattern and the temperature in this case is going to be proportional to the resistance so again you just uh, figure out how your resistance changes do some work with your um, electronics and then you can also uh, read off the temperature as well and another uh, variety that you may have seen is one of these um, contactless um, IR thermometers so you have your little uh, your little IR gun over here and what you probably would see is with these you see like a little red laser light coming out now that little red laser light that comes out all it's doing in that case is uh, just telling you where you're actually pointing the thing at it's not actually doing anything you know for the sensor itself all it's basically doing is just saying this is the area that you're actually reading and uh, what happens is is that there's a little sensor inside of there that is reading how much of the infrared light and how much heat is actually coming from the source you're looking at so it could be you know, anything from you know a stove uh, the, a wall a, a light bulb you know anything like that is basically any heat source and it just reads the amount of heat that's coming in and in this case the amount of heat that's coming in is going to be the power of the source so the power um, from the infrared light that's coming in is actually proportional to the temperature to the fourth power and by using you know a bunch of electronics you can actually figure out uh, uh, you know what the uh, temperature of the uh, the source you're actually looking at is so that's uh, a different one and the, re the way you actually measure the power is there's some absorbing medium in there and it changes temperature or you know there's a sensor that determines it but um, we're not going to get into all the those little subtleties uh, right there uh, the next thing we just want to talk about uh, when we're dealing with this is actually what happens with temperature changes so here, this is something that you know always screws students up. So we just have to be a little bit careful when we're talking about this. So just remember uh, the equation we had before. Now let's say we want to figure out well, what is the change in degrees Fahrenheit if I have a change in degrees Celsius. Well, we can't just say, okay, well the temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit. That does not mean, or I should say, one degree Celsius. That does not mean that the change in degrees Fahrenheit is going to be, you know, like thirty. 33.8 degrees. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so instead what we have to do is just be a little bit careful here. So the change in Fahrenheit is going to be my Fahrenheit you know, high temperature minus my Fahrenheit low temperature. So this is the two temperatures. That's my change in temperature. And this is going to be, I remember F2 is just going to be this thing right here. So it's going to be 9 fifths times the degree Celsius plus 32 minus, and I should say that's 2 over here, 9 fifths degree Celsius 1 plus 32. And what happens here is you'll notice that my 32 cancels out, right? That's 32 minus 32. So what happens here is we now have 9 fifths times the degree Celsius 2 minus 9 fifths times the degree Celsius 1, which of course is just 9 fifths degree Celsius 2 minus degree Celsius 1, which is just going to be uh, 9 fifths times the change in the degree Celsius. So the change in my degrees Fahrenheit is just going to be equal to 9 fifths times the change in my degrees Celsius. All right. Now, the reason that this is very important is because, you know, let's say you're talking, you're doing an experiment or you're measuring something and somebody says it's five degrees Celsius warmer um, today than yesterday. Well, that's five degrees Celsius change. Well, that's going to be five times nine fifths. That means that your temperature went up by nine degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, it's just five degrees Celsius warmer. That does not mean it's like 50 degrees warmer out there. Uh, that you just have to be very careful with these. Okay, so just you know, make sure uh, when you're you're doing with it that you only you basically you have this equation. You drop the 32. 
And conversely, we don't have to like rederive this if we're using our other equation, but we can very easily just say here that if we're dealing with the degree Celsius, uh, we can just write this as uh, 5 ninths times the degrees Fahrenheit is equal to the change in degrees Celsius. Okay, so remember our original equation, um, which was over here, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, that's 5 ninths uh, times Fahrenheit minus 32 is equal to Celsius. So essentially, if you just, you know, you'll have these two equations at some point, and if you're trying to figure out your temperature change, you use the original equation, you just drop the 32, because that 32 is just going to be an offset because of the intercept. All you're really interested in these cases is going to be the slope. So, you know, if I'm going here from point A to point B, that change is going to be the same if I do it over here or, you know, if I do it between these two points. Right? So if I'm looking between these two points or between these two points, the change is going to be exactly the same. Just the offset is different here, and only if we're figuring out the actual temperature do we need to worry about the 32. But if we're dealing with the temperature change, all we need in this case is just the slope. So that's why we're either going to have the 9 fifths or the 5 ninths in that case. All right, and the other thing uh, we can also look at is if we have uh, the Kelvin uh, scale. So if I'm dealing here with, uh, you know, how many Kelvin I have, well, remember the Kelvin was equal to my degree Celsius plus 273.15. Well, my change in terms of Kelvin, it's going to be K2 minus K1. So that's going to be degree Celsius 2 minus, whoops, plus the 273.15 minus my degree Celsius 1 plus 273.15. So right here, these 273s just cancel right out, and I'm going to be left with degrees Celsius 2 minus degrees Celsius 1, which is just your delta degree Celsius. So if you're dealing with Kelvin, a change in terms of Kelvin is going to be equal to the same thing, change in terms of Celsius. So if it's 5 Kelvin warmer, it's going to be 5 degrees Celsius warmer. Um, but if you're dealing with 5 Kelvin warmer, which is 5 degrees Celsius warmer, uh, that's actually going to be 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Okay, so you just have to uh, remember that. In this case, you're essentially just dropping off that, um, that offset again, that 273.15. Uh, so these are, those are the major things uh, with the temperature scales and you know, how we use thermometers and uh, do the calculations.